Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your goodness, mercy, grace, and compassion. Above all, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his precious blood, for your holy written word, and for the mighty Holy Spirit. Lord, it is with great joy, unspeakable and full of glory, that we deposit this service into your charge for safekeeping. We thank you in advance for anointing every ear, mind, heart, and soul to receive the engrafted word. And Lord, we welcome and invite the supernatural of God to be in manifestation in this service, even as the Spirit wills. And for all that shall be said, wrought, revealed, and manifested, we covenant to give you and you alone all the praise, the honor, and the glory. Father, thank you for anointing this festival of clay to minister life to your people boldly without fear, favor, or respect of persons that your word may proceed as it does from your own mouth. It will not return to you void, but it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereunto it is sent. We believe that we receive these petitions which we have desired of you, for we ask them in that mighty, matchless, and majestic name that is above every name, the name of Jesus and all the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. And uh, thank you all for coming out. And thank you all for tuning in. Praise God. You know, we've been talking about how to respond to the times. How do we respond to the times that we're living in? Well, okay. I want you to go to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. I'm going to do this as a quick little review because... We got into this in our earlier service, and I wanted to go over this again, but I also am going to take just a little bit of a different turn here. So again, that's Matthew chapter 16, and we'll begin at the first verse. It says, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. Of course, this is all directed at Jesus, and he answered. Jesus, that is to say, answered and said to them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. You ever seen a beautiful sunset? It, that comes after a beautiful day. And in the morning, he said, it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and lowering. In the morning when the sky is red, when the sun comes up, you know rain is on the way. It's what he's saying. He says, oh, you hypocrites. You can discern the face of the sky, but can you not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he's speaking of Jonah, and of course we know that Jonah was uh, swallowed up by the big fish, and he stayed in that fish's belly for three days. And of course, the fish knew the way to Nineveh, del delivered Jonah on the beach, spit him out, and Jonah's mission was to go and preach to the Ninevites. He did not want to do that. You see, when you read about these folks in the Bible, they're pretty much like us today. Or maybe we could say we today are pretty much like those folks back then. They were people, they suffered through the same, shall I say, intangible anomalies and issues that we do to this present day. There was jealousy and prejudice and all kinds of things back there. The same stuff is trying to dog us out today. And so this is, this is the case. Now, I want you to go to the book of Romans because how is it that we find ourselves in these times? And, and what, what's going on here? You know, because there's, there's some things going on. I, I was mentioning in the first service today that there are spirits you don't hear a lot of talk about this, but there are spirits functioning in the world today that are fierce in a, in a way that we've not really seen heretofore. That is to say, in decades gone by, but there's some incredible things we, we see. And I know the internet and the social media can bring a lot of things in real time, quickly and closely to us. You know, it took days for a newspaper to print photographs of some episode or incident that was going on in one part of the country. You had to wait a day or two before they could publish that picture in the newspaper. Not anymore. <laughs> the digital systems and technology have made it instant. I mean, 10 minutes after it happens, uh, boom, there it is in your face. And this has certain dynamic effects on the population that I have discovered. Number one, it can feel like it's in your backyard. 
when in fact it may be thousands of miles away. Um, we, we are seeing all kinds of things happening right now. And you know, I know right now there's a focus on the events and issues that are going on in the Middle East, in Afghanistan. You might say, well, you know, I'm not really interested in that. That really has nothing to do with me. Oh, but yes, it does. Uh, because, see, there is what I call a geopolitical landscape. We are not as, shall I say, apart from our international community and neighbors as we once thought that we were. We are more inextricably linked than we have known in times past. The world has always been about moving about, and people have been traveling and visiting different nations and countries of the world I mean, not only since Jesus' time, but well before that. Even back during the times of the ancient Egyptians and the the other uh, empires, such as the Babylonians and the Greeks and the Romans and so forth and so on. So international travel is nothing new. And international, shall I say, relationships or doing business uh, has been going on since the world has, has been here. Amen? Uh, Remember that it was at the place called the Tower of Babel where everybody was speaking the same language and God chose to confound the languages and people were divided up as you were by their languages. And so can you imagine just, I don't know how many people were there. The Bible doesn't give you a clue. It could have been tens of thousands. It could have been hundreds of thousands of people. It could have even been several million people. And can you imagine all those people just saying, speaking the same language, a big group like that. And the Lord said that because of that, He said, because they are all of one language. He said, nothing shall be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Now, that'll preach in a few ways. But I I just want to point out this. God confounded their languages there. That's that's why people say people babble on. That's where the statement comes from. But that's what started Babylon and, and the Babylonians. But the people had to end up finding who they could understand. Imagine a big giant group and you're running all over the place to find out who speaks the same language you do. And as a result, they began to spread out and became the various nations of the world. And that's the reason why we have the multiple languages that we have today. Now, I realize that I'm giving this in pretty simple English. I'm not going to get down into the minutia of linguistics and all of the other theorems that come out of that situation. I just take the Bible at face value. And just understand that's where the people were basically divided up into their various nations and groups and things like that. And to this day, they speak different languages. Now, how do do we get here? Well, I want you to go to the book of Romans chapter 1. I'm going to go through this. There's a good little portion of Scripture to read. Then we'll carry on with our response to the times. Okay, so Romans chapter 1. And I want to begin reading from verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Man, that's not only a mouthful, that's a mindful, okay? That's a lot to think about right there. Let's unpack that. The anger of God, that's what wrath is, the anger of God. So if you thought that God couldn't get angry, yes, he can. The difference between him and us is that, see, he can get angry and never sin, ever. You and I get angry, no telling what we're liable to do. <laughs> That's why we, we send so many people to anger management classes because when it gets out of control, Amen. folks start getting crazy yes. and they start doing things they wouldn't otherwise do because they're so angry. Amen. They become furious. That's where the term road rage comes from. Why? People get angry at some of the simplest things. Years ago, there was no road rage, <laughs> but, but recently... Road rage comes because you think you own the road. You think everybody should bow down to you. You've got this idea in your mind that you better not cut over in my lane or you better not cut me off or whatever, and you don't know that person in that automobile may not even be aware. Now, let me tell you something. I think my automobile has those safety features on it, so I know who's in the lane on either side of me. All right, and I know how close and how far away people are from me. It's kind of like sonar and radar are all wrapped up into one. But I'm going to tell you something. None of those things can substitute for these two eyeballs right here, looking out that front windshield and looking into that rear view mirror and the two side mirrors 
to watch your crazy fool coming up the road. Well, amen. Let me back up here. There, there's a spirit out there on our highways. The speed demons are everywhere. There are folks out there that I call, they get into this stitching maneuver at expressway speed. No, it's not expressway speed. They're 20 and 30 miles over the expressway speed limit. These guys are coming from behind you and in front of you and from the side of you. I mean, at 70, 80, and 90 miles an hour, and they're just stitching in and out. And I did, did I mention the motorcyclists? Oh, my good. We were cruising the other day down the interstate, and I did not see him coming from behind. See, the thing is, you know, my car sensors couldn't pick him up. He was like a mile, half a mile behind me. I can see at least that far. He came by so fast, and you know, our motorcyclists here in Georgia can split lanes. You understand? They can ride on the dotted line and split between cars and go on their way. I'm telling you, this dude came at least 90, 95 miles an hour. I didn't see him coming from behind, and his engine was loud. He had that thing wide open. He just rolls past me, and I'm going to be honest with you. I was startled behind the wheel, and I found myself, you know, I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, something, I'm close to something, and I'm almost about to make a correction. And, and fortunately, in a split second, you know, the Spirit of God calmed me down so that, no, that was just a motorcycle. And I mean, listen, I didn't see him two more seconds after he passed me. He was gone. Yeah, he's going so fast. And see, I wish I had seen him coming back up. I would have been prepared for the sudden occurrence and the noise and all that went with it and his little breeze, too, you know. He didn't create a breeze enough to knock my car out of the lane, you know. But it was just startling, the sound and his speed. And I'm just saying, you know, there's some people out there on the road that may be just a little more, shall I say, fragile, uh, you know, in their operation of their automobile than I. And they could have been totally startled. And to be honest with you, it could have created a chain reaction wreck. And that would have been tragic. But that's, that's what's going on out there. But the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all, un all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. This is what we're living through and living with today. Men, as I told you, they're redefining everything. They're changing things. They're calling good evil. They're calling evil good. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. See, when the Bible says the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, and all them that dwell therein, we're, all that is the property of God. As I said in previous statements, look, that's the copyright of God. <clears throat> the earth, the, everybody that dwells there, they're, they're all the copyright of God. We all are manufactured products of God. <clears throat> and I'm not trying to talk about us as if we were widgets, but we are individually created, fearfully and wonderfully made by God. <clears throat> Now, that being the case, God has a stamp in each one of us. In other words, nobody can cash in on his design. See, when you hear about men cloning creatures and this kind of thing, that's dangerous. That's men trying to be God. I, I'm serious. I don't care what you're cloning, a sheep, a bird, a dog. Listen, and, and listen, they're playing around with humans too. They're doing it at a cellular level. Uh, I am aware of a case that came out. You haven't heard another word about that case probably because they knew it was so ethically uh, diabolical. But there was some experimentation that was done on the DNA of some humans, a, a set of twin girls or something, and they're trying to figure out, tr get rid of, you know, disease and things like that. See, you don't understand you're never going to get rid of sin by human means, okay? Uh, it takes the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing more, nothing less. That, that's it. You can't splice it and dice it out of the human being. It, you just can't do that. Scripture says we were born in sin and shapen in iniquity. And you can't get to thinking that you're a God almighty to the point that, oh, you know what, we're just going to, remove that so human beings won't have to suffer this, that, and the other. 
But that, sadly, that, that was the penalty that passed upon all humankind since the fall in the Garden of Eden because, see, the original sin had to do with rebellion against God. And it's still messing with people to this day. It's just evolved or developed over the generation of humans from the Garden of Eden unto this time. So notice, so when it said verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them because we're made in his image and after his likeness, there is an innate desire in all humankind to worship. It is a, it's a desire. It's an appetite. It's something that comes in all human beings. Why? Because we're all spirits that possess souls that live or are housed in a body. And each one of those components has appetites or desires, okay? So there is an innate, meaning at birth, desire not only instinctively for little babies to nurse in order to gain nourishment and grow, desired sincere milk and so forth, but also there's an innate desire in us to worship because we're spirits, we're spirit beings. It's just a natural, there's something, I've got to worship something. Now, truth be told, you were designed to worship God. But if you misdirect it, you end up worshiping a rock, a tree, a river, an animal, or some other thing in the place of Almighty God. And that misplaced worship leads you directly into something called idolatry. Because anything that attempts to take the place of God or that you put in the place of God becomes an idol and you are engaged in the practice of idolatry. And this is the world that we're living in. Because there, people have, you can make an idol out of almost anything. Get ready for this. Fasten your spiritual seat belts. You can make your children an idol. You can make family an idol. You can make friends an idol. Now, I'm just talking about the human kind of idols. But, but it happens. That's the reason why we have the words like iconic. And, the, and listen, people say, oh, he or she referring to certain celebrities or famous people, is my idol. That was my childhood idol. We just sort of tossed the word around, you know, like, you know, it's no big deal. That was my idol, da, 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 da. Now, we know what you mean in that context, but at the same time, if you're not careful, they're still an idol. And they be, in, in other words, you'll find yourself giving more deference to them than you would to the Most High God who deserves all of our worship and is due all of our worship. But this, this verse 19 says that something's in us that lets us know that we're virtually incomplete without a connection to God. Now, why is that? Why don't we just come in here pre-programmed to worship God? Because it's very simple. Love always has a choice. God gave that same choice in the Garden of Eden. God said, here's the deal. I got a tree in the middle of this garden, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's my tree. Please don't touch it. Everything else, all these other trees I planted for you with all the fruit that they offer and all the benefits, you may freely eat of those trees, but this one that is exclusively mine, do not touch it. Do not eat it because when you do, you will surely die. And then, of course, we know the story. The devil comes, usurps the body of the serpent, and he comes talking to Eve. It all begins with a conversation, by the way. And so, you know, hath God said, he questions the situation. Eve says, well, the Lord said that, you know, and he gave, she gave him the spiel. And he said, you will not surely die. Now, this is amazing to me because, you see, this is the first word that we have in Scripture that comes as a conflict directly against the Word of God. The Word of God was what he told Adam, all right? And Adam, in turn, told Eve. So that was the Word of the Lord. But then the devil comes along and directly contradicts it. You will not surely die. He has, used, he has been using the same method since the garden. He's still using it today. 
He dares men. Go ahead and do this. Go ahead and do it. And, 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 and men might stop and think, well, you know, something bad might happen out of this. And, ah, nothing bad's going to happen. Just go ahead and do it. Same thing. All the way from the garden to the 21st century. <laughs> you will not surely die. Nothing's going to happen. You know, the devil is a liar. And he is the father of lies. Amen. Moving right along. And notice it says, God has showed it to him. In other words, in that great day of judgment, not one human soul will stand before God and accuse God and say, now God, you never told me you were who you were. You never told me you were real. You, 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 you never said anything. And this, it won't be able to stick. You, you can't stick anything to God. It won't stick. You can't accuse him. You can't allege anything against him. It'll never happen. The scripture says here, God, listen, which may be known, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Them is us, humans. All right, because God has showed it unto them. You know you didn't hang the sun and the moon and the stars. You know you didn't pour out the oceans with the span of your hand. Now, you might be mowing a lot of grass, but you know you didn't exactly plant it. Now, you, you know, landscaper might have come and put some sod down for you and whatnot. But I tell you what, rest assured that the sod growers did not manufacture the grass or the seed from which the grass came. God made the seed. And God made the soil for the seed to grow in. Amen. Now, they're playing around with hybrids, you know, what do they call those things? Well, nectarine with a half peach and a half plum, whatever it is. Uh, they've they've cross-fertilized all kinds of things. And I guess that's what gives them the idea they can do the same thing with people. And they, they just want to be able to come out and tell you, you know what, we, we hatched a human out of a test tube. It's never going to happen. It's not going to happen. And, and the whole concept here of going against God's ordered institutions and systems of the way things work is an act of futility. It is an act of foolishness to attempt to do that. And it is an act of confusion, which God is not the author of. When people, when these people that are telling you they're, they're not sure what they are, that's, that's confusion. How in the world can you be confused when you've only got two choices? That's it. You are either a male or you are a female. That's it. I mean, I really don't have anything else to really say into that. We can talk about all the different thought patterns and issues and things like that, but that's, that's, that's what it is. So when you attempt to, and I think I gave a long drawn little illustration of this when I was working for the fast food company, you know, and this guy said, put two filet of fish on a Big Mac bun. I said, wait a minute, man, that's a violation of copyright. You know, because the filet of fish sandwich is trademarked as one particular item it has a filet of fish, it's got a half slice of cheese and some tartar sauce on a steamed bun. Got that? The bun wasn't toasted. It's steamed. Now, you can request for the bun to be toasted if you want, but you can't, you can't change the makeup of the sandwich. All right, and this guy wouldn't put two, two filet of fish on a Big Mac bun. You know, the bun, Big Mac bun had the sesame seed crown, the little middle section, and then what we call the base of the bun. And you put two all beef patties, Amen. special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, and onions on a sesame seed bun. That is a Big Mac. The only thing that was supposed to go on the Big Mac bun was what I just said. Now, it's been 50 years, at least since I've been making those sandwiches, and I still remember the formula. Or the recipe. And, it, and, and see, they had a system. You, it, it, when you came in to work at that place, we taught you the system. You might have seen the Big Mac on TV and said, man, anybody can make that. No, you couldn't. I found that out too. When I hired people to work, they couldn't make a Big Mac until we showed them how to do it because it was a system. Because we had an ability to put six or 12 of those Big Mac sandwiches up at one time in less than five minutes. Can you fix, I mean, seriously, can you go home and fix a dozen Big Mac sandwiches with all that stuff on it? No, there was a system, man. It was like an assembly line. 
If you've ever worked in one, you know what I'm talking about. How did I get into that? All right, back to Romans. All right, so it says in verse 20, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. God's letting you know, look, I've got this thing in order. There's a system here. There's an order. It's amazing. You know, I watched it the other day. Uh, well, yeah, we, we were in a, in a home-going service and at the graveside, and there was a little child. child probably couldn't have been much more than about three, four years old. And, you know, traditionally speaking, everybody's going by the gravesite where the casket is mounted up on the little deal there before they lower it down and the family leaves, go to cars and whatnot. And nobody really had to instruct that little girl what to do. You know, with her own little eyes, she could see how to navigate through the passageway she had to go. Now, there was somebody holding her hand to help her along, but she had plenty of sense. You know, she didn't jump in the hole where the casket was sitting or nothing like that. You, you know what I'm saying? She knew to keep on rolling like that. Now, now, there's something invisible. This air is invisible. Mm -hmm. And yet, we know how to move through it. Mm -hmm. we are, see, look what it says. The things, listen, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. That seems like a contradiction of terms. How can you clearly see the invisible things of God? Amen. Obviously, you must have another set of organs that are on a spiritual level as opposed to the natural level. Your, your eyes and my eyes cannot see the air, though the air is here and we know it. Thank God. We're breathing it, and that's why we're living. But these invisible things God's talking about, what does he say? They are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. When bees hatch, out of their eggs. I'm talking about the little honeybees that go around, you know, uh, pollinating the different plants. They didn't go to school. Not one of them. They hatch out of their eggs, and eventually, you know, they grow their wings and whatnot, and they take off from the hive, and what are they looking for? Flowers. They know, I got to go to that flower. Okay, and when I go, I'm going to, you know, drink the nectar out of it, and as a result, as I move from flower to flower, I'm carrying the fertilizing seeds of the plants to other plants so that they will grow and produce fruit. That's what they do. Without pollination, with that little bee, <laughs> you and I are not going to have much to eat. That, that's why God said, I, I take the simple things to confound the wise. Things that seem like they're not to confound the things that are. People don't stop to think it's the honeybees that go and pollinate everything in order for the trees and the vines and things to grow so you and I go to the grocery store and we get the fruit of that. But if those bees weren't out there doing what they were doing, you and I wouldn't have much to speak of. How does it they hatch? Never spent one day in a nursery in a grade school, a kindergarten, you know, they, spiders have never spent a day in Georgia Tech. How do they engineer that web? And, and nobody has come up with a design like that. We learn from it. Humans have learned from those things. We, that's why the Bible says, God says, hey, you want to check my engineering and my systems out? Proverbs 6, consider the ant. And consider the spider, how he spins a web. And, and, and they, they're in king's palaces. Yeah. Because they can't quite get to every nook and cranny in the palace. But those, those spiders can. They can crawl up the side of the wall, go up in the corner, man, spin a web and catch every insect that's flying around. And they never get stuck in their own web. Amazing, isn't it? And yet, they hatch. No school. No training. Nothing. It's a manifestation of the things that are invisible, but the things that are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, of course, Romans is addressing folk. I'm bringing in these illustrations of God's creatures to show you how he has designed them and that they know exactly what to do with what's what. 
It's like they, they, they hatch and are born into the world knowing what they're supposed to do. Birds fly, fish swim, creeping things creep, right? Now, notice, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain or empty in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. That's what you are witnessing today. Exactly. When they knew God. Now, when he says they knew God, not necessarily in the intimate way as we that are born of God's spirit. But see, remember what I told you, that all human beings have an innate desire to worship. They know inside of themselves that they need to worship. And I warn that if the worship is misguided, misdirected, and that can happen, the devil can suggest it. People can succumb to foolishness and whatnot. Remember we talked about 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this world has blinded not the eyes, but the minds. That's what you see out here right now. Minds have been blinded to the truth. Amen. Lest the glorious gospel should shine through and dispel the darkness. It's darkness. It's spiritual darkness. It's a seemingly invisible thing, the, the deception and the delusion of the enemy that is tricking people today, that is deceiving them, that is manipulating mindsets. You, listen, you've got church folks and faith-based people, so to speak, that feel, well, you know, everybody else is doing this. I'm going to do it. It's something that goes completely contrary to what God's instructions call for. And, and, and now we're, we're at a place where we're trying to lure everybody in to the kingdom. No, let the word do the work. See, Jesus said, preach the gospel to every preacher, uh, to every creature, excuse me. Yet a preacher could use it too. <laughs> preach the gospel. And, and he says, it divides folks immediately. They that believe and are baptized shall be saved. And he that believeth not shall be damned. That's it. It didn't say embellish it with anything. It didn't say sprinkle a little of this on it or pour a little measure of that in it. Present the good news of Jesus. Present the gospel of the kingdom, whether they are young, middle-aged, or old. When you present the gospel of the kingdom to folk, they're going to come to a conclusion, you know what? I'm either in this thing or I'm out of this. I'm either on or I am off. You know, the term binary has a different use today. <laughs> when they say you are not non-binary, <clears throat> that means you're wide open in the gender issue. And they give you five or six options about what you are. That's what it means to be non-binary. If you're binary, it means you're one of these static, regular people who, know, who, who only accepts the, the, the difference between male and female. Because mm -hmm. binary means two. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, yeah, that's the deal. Mm -hmm. That's the reality, mm -hmm. is the binary system. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. I don't, I don't understand this, you know, but, but all computers work on a binary system. Amen. All of them. I don't care how deep they get. I don't care how much they advance these devices, these digital devices. They all work on the simple binary principle, mm -hmm. on and off. They just, they just mash more of these functions into these little chips and things like that. But at the end of the day, it's all about turning a circuit on and turning a circuit off and doing it in so fast and in a combination of ways that it produces all of your characters and digits and computations and your uh, transactions and all this kind of thing. It's a binary system. Amazing you can't change that. There's no way to really literally improve upon it. And God has some things, I'm telling you, in place here that men cannot really improve upon in the sense that God established it. All right, so going on. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You look up in that sky, you know you didn't put it there. And don't be crazy enough to get men to thinking, you know, we put that there. Oh, man, I, I'm, I'm so tempted. Praise Jesus. 
uh, you know, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm going to go ahead on in there. I, and I know there's a lot of talk. You, you knew I was going in there anyway. Uh, but, but I know there's a lot of talk about the climate, and it's changing. And, you know, I remember somebody said that the most fierce thing that humanity will have to face is climate change. Well, listen to me closely. In a general sense, no. In a specific sense, yes. Why? The climate is always changing. But now, in these times, the climate is definitely changing in a more pronounced and profound way. But it's not for the reasons that men want you to think. And see, the reasons that men want you to think, they want to draw you into something that begins, to, hang on now, to worship the creation more than the creator. So the next thing you know, you begin to marshal all of your resources, all of your efforts and energy into attempting to change something you can't change. To manipulate or maneuver something you cannot manipulate and that you cannot maneuver. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, when those hurricanes come in off the Atlantic or out in the Pacific, there's only one thing I notice that everybody down there is doing in Miami or any other place that's in the path. They've gone to Home Depot. They picked up a truckload of plywood, got hammer and nails. They go into their places of business in their houses. They're going to nail that plywood up there in hopes of keeping the storm from blowing out their windows. There isn't anything available at Home Depot, Walmart, or any other retailer that can turn that storm away. Amen. Can I get a witness here? Amen. In fact, there's, there's no place in the marketplace where you can go and get a device and untwist a tornado. <laughs> what are you kidding? Well, you think you're going to put a super fan down here and if the funnel cloud lands on that little fan and it's turning, you know, counterclockwise because that's what they do in this hemisphere. They turn counterclockwise at two, 300 miles an hour. What are you going to do, put a device down here and turn it back the other way? Nobody's been able to do that. The only thing you can do where a tornado is concerned is get out of its way. You have no means or method to undo it. These natural disasters occur. Earthquakes happen, and you know what? Just like the one that happened in Haiti, they happen. And you know what? What are you going to do? I've been in an earthquake. Let me tell you something. It seems like forever, but it was only a minute, maybe at the most a minute and a half. But the shaking in that minute or minute and a half is so violent so forceful. You, you got to realize, ladies and gentlemen, square miles of ground are shaking at one time. And that force is a force to be reckoned with on any structure, homes, tall buildings. Now, this the, the earthquake I was in happened to be in the nation of Japan. And see, the Japanese have learned to build buildings in their cities and towns you can't see, but underneath there, those buildings are, are on giant rollers. So that when an earthquake occurs, their buildings tend to flow with the, the wave motion. So instead of cracking and breaking and falling down, they just sway with the motion. That's what I noticed. I happened to look out the window where I was when the earthquake was going on. And when I looked out there, I'm telling you, I saw trees doing just like that. Trees. You ever cut a tree down and chop it up for wood? You know how heavy those trees are? You know how much effort and labor it takes to chop them up and make firewood out of them? Well, the earthquake just had them dancing out there, just like that. I said, you know, at first I thought I was saying things, but I wasn't. I happened to be, uh, my sister and her husband were over there because her husband was in the Army stationed there. And in the morning when she got up, because I was up way early in the morning, because I, I felt the earthquake. And I told her, I said, you know, Joan, I said, there's an earthquake this morning. She said, oh, no, you're kidding. I said, oh, no. And then she turned on the news, and they said, yeah, there was an earthquake that struck. But see, they were so used to them happening, they didn't feel it. That one was too low for her to feel. <laughs> I don't know how what I saw out that window was too low for them to feel. I felt it. It shook me out of the bed. 
at four, five o'clock, no, five o'clock in the morning, because it was daylight was hitting, and I could see those trees out there. I said, man, this is amazing. N never seen anything like it. But, but you have no means or method against that. You cannot stop that. But, but see, if we can get you into con convinced that yeah, there's something you can do about that, but there really isn't. Somebody said, well, all the factories putting out all the soot and all the whatever pollutions and things like that uh, have changed the climate or whatever. I'm going to tell you what's changing the climate, if you must know. You see them fires burning out there? You see that smoke coming across the country like that? Yeah, it's changing a little bit of the climate. It may block some sunlight for a period of time. It's visible from outer space. But as that smoke goes over, I'll tell you another thing it'll change. It'll change your respiration, respiratory system. Because you know what? I'll never forget, we were flying down to Florida one time, and wildfires had broke out down there somewhere between Jacksonville and Miami. And, I mean, they were fierce. I want to tell you, man, you th we are 30, 35,000 feet. We can smell the smoke. We're flying at four or 500 miles an hour, 30, 35,000 feet. You can see the fires and the smoke down there, but somehow it rose all the way up to that level and it gotten into the, the air conditioning intake of the aircraft. We could actually smell the smoke. What are you going to do about that? And hope they burn out or hope you got enough water to put them out. And, and that's pretty much it. I'm just saying, folks, the devil is selling all kinds of stuff to people now to get them caught up, and it is absolutely a manifestation of worshiping the creation more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. 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 Yes. So... When they knew God, they verse 21, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed, watch that, watch that word, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Now, what are you out there trying to save? You're trying to save the birds, the beasts, the endangered species. You will move human beings out of the way. You will, in other words, you will displace that which is made in the image of God and after his likeness for what? Oh, birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wow. Look, don't misunderstand me. I believe we should be good stewards of our environment. I don't think we should pollute or mess up or toxify anything. We should be responsible. We should find ways. I believe God's got plenty of ideas and ways and means for us to do that. But when you begin to worship the creation more than you do the creator, you are on shaky ground. And there's no doubt why we are facing so many of the things that we're facing. Wherefore, why, and, and behind all this, boy, this is the powerful verse, verse 24. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. It's the stuff we want. It's the stuff we lust after. It's the stuff that we go after that messes us up. He says, he gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped, listen, and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And for this cause, you know, I'd like to substitute the word cause with stupidity, but for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. I'm glad that word didn't say infection, but he gave them up to vile affections. In other words, as a result of worshiping the creature more than the creator, we, are, we expose ourselves to vile affections. In other words, vile things that affect us these vile things that we otherwise would not be affected by because we would have the good sense and the good spiritual sense not to move into those spaces. As a result of this foolishness, we expose ourselves to vile affections. See, the word affection is in there. Got it? 
you begin to become, you know, you know, kids, you talk about kids having affection for one another. No, when you get vile in the, into that mix, the affection can become an infection and can become very detrimental. All right? So for this cause, God gave him up unto vile affections for even, now this is how deep it can go, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Now I want to tell you there's a segment of our population that does not want this verse ever spoken. They don't want this verse ever acknowledged because this verse clearly denotes and defines God's plan and purpose for men and women. And he also explains what happens when we do refuse to understand the purpose of a thing. Abuse is inevitable. And God is warning us. God, God, I didn't, oh man, I didn't say this. I didn't do this. You, you reading the same Bible I'm reading right here. I just read it. Where it said that God gave him up to vile affections. In other words, your affections are no longer normal. You now have an affection for that which is considered from a biblical viewpoint, vile. And it, listen, I want to tell you, if it's considered that way from a biblical standpoint or a godly standpoint, and God says it's vile, it's vile. It's destructive. It is injurious. It is dangerous. It is deadly. That's what's packed in that word vile and then the combination vile affection. God says you're moving into a zone, you're moving into a space that can ultimately take you out. Frankly, see, when you get stuck into a vile affection, you move into a mode, get ready for this, you move into a mode of self-destructive behavior. It starts with self-destructive thought. See what it say? They changed the truth of God into a lie, all right? They changed the truth of God into a lie. And then professing themselves to, become wise, to be wise, they became fools. So all of this is self-destruction of the human person. Okay, time flashing on me there. And it says that, yeah, men, and, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meet or fitting. You see, the penalties that come are not because God sees you behind your little door or in your apartment or in your little place refusing the natural arrangement of things. It's not that. It's in the system. It's already there. It's built into us. Remember what God said? The invisible things of God, they're recognized. When he said, clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. When you go there, when you abuse the truth of God, It's not that he has to get off the throne to initiate it. It's built into the structure of his system so that when you engage in it, it, it ushers the vile affections and the penalties and the, and the self-destructive uh, elements that are associated with it. They're called addictions, among other things. Because addictions are a form of pushing us into a self-destructive mode. It's heavy, and yet that's what you see going on out here. The dangerous part is when they attempt to push it on you and say that unless you become a part of it, unless you accept it and do so graciously and, and affectionately and all that, you can't make me do that. I will treat you as a human being. I will treat you as a fellow person. I will treat you as my understanding of you being made in the image of God and after his likeness. But I will not swallow hook, line, sinker, the fisherman and his boots in the boat <laughs> of your vile affection philosophy. I am not obligated to accept that. 
and see what's going on now. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to speak very clean, plainly and very boldly. They want to indoctrinate your children in the subsequent generations to make normalcy out of trying to change the truth of God into a lie. Amen. And consequently, let me tell you how dangerous this is, though they're not going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you this. Amen. Because that's to pre-program your children for self-destruction. That's what is, that's what, the, listen, the devil is crazy. What did he do with little kids when he didn't want them around? He killed them. That's why they killed the little kids with Jesus. That's why Pharaoh said every first, all those male children born in Egypt, because see, uh, uh, Moses was due. He said, wipe them all out. Throw them to the crocs in the Nile. And that's exactly what he did. Devil pushed the king. King did that. That's what, that really happened in Jesus' day. When, when, listen, when Herod said, there's not room for two kings here, and the wise men came and said, there's a king about to be born, and they had ways and means of knowing that, and it was true. He said, get rid of all these little children that are two years age of, of age and under. See, he couldn't be accurate. He didn't have that kind of accuracy, and neither did those guys advising him. But he said, I figure that he's got to be at least two years old now. Wipe them all out. That's where the book of Lamentations comes from. There was weeping in Rama or Rama. Rachel weeping for her children, and she would not be comforted because they were not. And I want to tell you something here. The devil wants to repeat the same thing. He's using high-tech means to do it. He's using more clever tricks and delusion to do it. So as your children from little ones grow up in there, believing that that's normal and that's okay, no, no. It's to program them to choose that vile affection which would destroy them. I'm not talking about any individual person. And that's another thing. That's the other insidious. That's where you hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because I, as a man of God, as a preacher, I'm not talking about any particular individual. I'm showing you how the system and the framework of the kingdom of God works mm -hmm. and that when you think that you can push against it, that there's no consequential result, you are moving into fool's territory. Mm -hmm. To think you can change the truth of God into a lie and profess yourself to be wise yet become a fool, this is the reason why. These folks professing themselves to be wise to indoctrinate our children with this philosophy and doctrine of demons? Because that's what it is. I didn't call you a demon. I said the doctrine emanates because it's inspired by demons. It's doctrines that demons teach. Where are the demons? In the people that are promulgating the doctrine. The demon provides the doctrine, but he gets hosts, he gets flunkies, pardon me, to inject it into the system. And then tries to hold a gun to your head to tell you you better put it in them too. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And remember now, ladies and gentlemen, that armor includes an offensive weapon. It ain't all defensive. It's an offensive weapon. It's called the sword of the spirit. That's the only offensive weapon we got, which is the word of God. So when it says that having done all to stand, stand therefore, you know what you stand doing? Speaking the word. You speak the word. You say what the word says. I don't care what names they call you. I don't care how much they ostracize you. I don't care how much they push you out of their your little circle of associations and friends. You can't be my friend anymore. You saw what happened, man, the last election and other things like that. People were unfriending people and throwing them out and hating people and this and that and, and dividing and whatnot. Look, I'm, I'm just talking about, I'm talking about on the principles from the word of God. I'm not picking and choosing sides. I said, I'm not talking about an individual. I'm speaking from the framework of the word of God. See, Jesus didn't call any names. You know what he said? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. He didn't call your neighbor's name. He didn't even, you understand? He doesn't have to do that. that. That's the faith he has in you. 
that you ought to be able to recognize who a neighbor is and to show them the kind of unconditional love that God provides like he did for you. That's the only countermeasure to what you see going on here. And last, and truly last, Jesus said, occupy until I come. He didn't mean just stick in one place. He said, you do the business I left you here to do until I return. He didn't say, oh, you don't have to do it because these people go crazy. Or you don't have to do it because they try to indoctrinate your kids. Or you don't have to do it because they're changing the truth of God into a lie. He said, you occupy until I come. You get out here and you do what I told you to do. What was that? Preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. Share the word of God. Speak the truth in love. Mm -hmm. Follow the instructions of Jesus. Be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Bless them that curse you. You know, bless and curse not. Uh, those that, that rile against you and say all manner of evil against you for Christ's sake. You know, love them so forth and so on. I know, and see, it, all of it goes against unregenerated human nature. But none of it goes against the nature of God. And God says, I want you to have my nature. And his nature is exhibited through the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5. That's the nature of God. That is expressed through humankind, all nine of those fruit. And when you are constantly producing and exhibiting that, even in the face of vile, foolish, evil, wicked, crooked, and perverse generations, remember what the Bible said, against such... There is no law. Mm -hmm. They'll try. They, do you know, look how creative they have to be to make a law mm -hmm. to stop you mm -hmm. from being like the Lord, mm -hmm. from being a purveyor of the word. They have to invent laws. Mm -hmm. I started to preach from Daniel 6 then. Mm -hmm. That's what they did in Daniel 6. Mm -hmm. That's what sent Daniel to the lion's den. Mm -hmm. They had to make up a law to go against Daniel's God. This is what they're going to do here. This is what they're doing in other nations of the world. They're making laws to outlaw you because you worship the true, the one, and the only, and the most high God. You got a man over there on the other side of the world who is setting himself up to be God. Destroying churches telling the pastors that they must completely reprogram whatever they're saying to, be, to work, teach the people to worship the state and the head of the state and not Jesus. Well, I don't know if there's a spot that hot in hell, man, for you. <laughs> My goodness. But, but I tell you what, you know, I guess if Nebuchadnezzar could heat up the fiery furnace seven times hotter than hot as God, I guess there's a spot for this fellow. But nevertheless, you know, there's still time. But I, I want to tell you, it's happening in other places at an incredible rate. People just like you that have dreams, aspirations, they have family, they have jobs, they have skills, they have hopes, just like you. Mm -hmm. And they're being tortured and they're being tormented and they're being executed in droves simply because they're followers of Christ. Mm -hmm. And if you think that that stuff can't creep and crawl over here mm -hmm. in the land of the free and the home of the brave, you better think again. Amen. That's why we need to be fortified with the word of God. And do just like Ephesians 6 says, stand. Take your stand. And having done all to stand. And your only offensive weapon is the word. It didn't say your fist. Amen. It didn't say your foot. It said the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Father, thank you. Thank you for the word. Thank you for the anointing. Thank you for the boldness. Thank you for the clarity. Lord, embolden every true man and woman of God in the world to speak your truth without fear, favor, or respect of persons. In the name of Jesus. For we don't know always who it is that we're speaking to or their position in this world of influence or power or favor 
And it could be the difference between life and death, blessing and cursing. And I pray we all choose life that we and our seed may live and live to glorify you and to show indeed let our good works be seen of others that they may glorify you which is our Father in heaven. Thank you Lord Jesus. Glory be to God. In the name of Jesus I speak right now through the anointing of the Most High God to those whose minds have been blinded but want to know the truth. Some of you out there, there are many voices in the world. None of them is without signification. Some of you have been persuaded. You've been listening to voices that sound intelligent, that sound as if they know what they're talking about. They make a mockery of the things of God. They make a mockery of the truth. They know that you are a follower of the Lord or at least that you have an intense interest in the things of God and they want to dissuade you from that system of belief. And I tell you, let their money perish with them to think that they could do that. Let that influence go by the wayside. And now in the name of Jesus, I speak the word of God, the word of truth, the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ for the entrance of his word brings light. And I say that the entrance of that word and that light that holds all things together by the word of his power comes now to dismantle the blindness that has been placed upon your mind against the word of God, lest the glorious gospel will shine through and penetrate and bring you to the genuine knowledge of the truth. God, I speak to those that have been confused by the devil, those who've been deluded and deceived by doctrines of demons that are being perpetrated through our institutions and systems right now. In the name of Jesus, I pray right now that these chains are broken. I pray that these, in the name of Jesus, I command these demons, unclean spirits, spirits of mental and spiritual blindness, come out of them now. In the name of Jesus, loose them and let them go. And Father, I thank you that your light shines through right now and dispels the darkness. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory be to God. Lord, restore peace in those families and in those households where there has been the spirit of confusion in the name of Jesus, where there has been the promulgation of changing the truth of God into a lie, where there have been those who profess themselves to be wise yet became fools, let your transcendent glory flow in now to turn what Satan meant for evil and destruction to the good and the glory of your kingdom and to the advantage of those he would otherwise victimize. And I call it done by faith in Jesus' name. God, I'm speaking to teachers. I'm speaking to administrators. I'm speaking to business people. I'm speaking to corporate magnates and moguls. I'm speaking right now to politicians in the name of Jesus. I'm speaking to civic leaders in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And I'm declaring and I'm decreeing right now, God, that a mighty burst of the light of your word enters right now, moves that darkness off of their mind, that God, before it's too late, before they go too far, that they will be able to reverse course, God. Lord, I recognize the times and the seasons and that even we're witnessing that even leaders of the nations of the world cannot make sound decisions and they don't even know why. God, there are leaders everywhere that are, that are making decisions that go completely against even human dignity. And certainly goes against your word. They are not treating the poor as you said in the word. No matter what category of poor they're in. They're abusing them. They're misusing them. They're tormenting and torturing them and even murdering them. And so Father in the name of Jesus. I thank you for that burst of light right now. In the mighty name of Jesus. I plead the power of the blood over all of them. And I invoke your mighty, mighty power in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, whoever you are, listen, I want to pray a prayer with you. We're going to go boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find grace to help in time of need. Maybe you were caught up in that maelstrom of foolishness and 
confusion, but God wants to bring you out. He is a deliverer. He is a miracle worker. He is a healer. He is the giver of every good and perfect gift that comes down from above, for he is the father of lights, and he loves you with an unconditional love, and he desires for you to be close to him. So pray this prayer with me right now as we go boldly to the throne and say, Dear God, in heaven, I come to you realizing that in my life I have sinned and come short of your glory. I repent of all of my sin, and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who died on the cross and shed his blood to save me from all of my sin, is the Lord of my life. And I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead, that I might be justified, just as if I had never sinned. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and live in me now. I believe that I receive eternal life through Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior, that I am now made a new creation in Christ Jesus, born again of the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer with us today, congratulations to you. Welcome to the family of God. You've literally passed from spiritual death into everlasting life. Because the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You're a part of God's family and you're a part of the citizenry of the kingdom of heaven. Congratulations to you.